Christ. Well, welcome. Welcome to the second week in the Crazy Maker series. As you guys see, what we are going to be talking about here today, for those who were here last week, this series is all about the people in our lives that make us crazy. And what we're going to be talking about today is what you probably wanted to talk about last week, but I fooled you a little bit there last week. Last week, what we did is before we were going to look outside and see how the crazy makers treat us, we said last week we need to look and see if maybe we are the crazy makers. So what we did last week is before we look out the window, we said we're going to look in the mirror. And we looked at last week about the kind of behaviors that we may be um, engaged in and how can we can live a life of peace and wisdom in our relationships. Today, we're going to look out the window. And we are going to look at those people that push our buttons and drive us crazy and make us angry. And we're going to see how God wants us to deal with them in a healthy manner. Here's the thing about crazy makers. Agree or disagree with me. Crazy makers have an incredible ability and power to turn your day and your life upside down. It's amazing, isn't it? You're walking down the street. Everything is fine. The coffee is good. The birds are chirping. The flowers and everything is fine. And then you run into that crazy maker outside the water cooler or at your cubicle or some situations at the breakfast table. You run into that crazy maker and on a dime, the whole day flips. Everything is upside down. They can make you go from happy to crazy in 2.4 seconds flat, can't they? They can make you go from singing to the birds to talking to yourself quickly like that in an instant. What we're going to talk about today is a strategy to deal with those people who push our buttons in different ways. First, before we do that, though, some facts about anger. Did you know that the average woman loses her temper three times a week? The average man, higher or lower, six times a week, okay? Six times a week, the average man. When they are surveyed, women, like, lose their temper usually about what kinds of things? About people, okay? Did someone say trivial? No, I didn't say trivial. Okay, <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> single guy, single guy. It was a single guy, don't worry. About people, relationship kind of things. This person said this, this person did this. Men tend to lose their temper about what? Stuff, okay? Whether it's traffic jams or the TV is broken or somebody dropped the whatever or the, the men tend to lose their, their cool about stuff. Women tend to be about people. One thing we know very clearly, women tend to be more verbal with their expression of anger. Men tend to be more physical with their expression of anger, including grunting. All people agree that the place that you express anger the most is at home. Right? It goes without saying, number one, just mathematically speaking, you spend more time at home okay, than you do in most places. But also, more importantly, is that the people that you love the most have the greatest potential to annoy you and irritate you and drive you bonkers. All right? And we'll see why that is in a little bit. This statistics on the amount of people and anger and things like that, there's been studies done. And there was a great study done, a book written by a Dr. S.I. McMillan. And S.I. McMillan discovered 51 illnesses that can be directly attributed to anger. 51 illnesses, physical illnesses, that can be directly related to anger and caused by anger in your life. And this is one of the quotes from, from his book. He said, habitual anger is not only destructive, it has the potential to kill. Getting habitually angry is like, a is like taking a small dose of some slow-acting poison arsenic, for example, every day of your life. No one likes to get angry. The doctors tell us that it ain't good for us. God tells us it's not good for us either. But let me ask you a question. Is anger always wrong? No, it's not wrong. And in fact, I propose that sometimes it is wrong to not get angry. And there are some times where anger is the only appropriate response. For example, you come into my house, you hurt my wife, you hurt my kids, I will get angry. And if I don't get angry, something's wrong with me. It means I don't love you, or I don't care, or I'm checked out. If I see a kid getting bullied by another kid, and you see a kid getting bullied, you should get angry. And I don't think there's another appropriate response. You see corruption. You see racism. You see abuse. Any of these things, if you respond with anything other than anger, 
then you probably responding in an incorrect kind of a way. Anger is not against love. Anger is actually the other side of the coin of love. Love and anger go together. Because you can't really get angry at people that you don't love. You can't really get angry if you don't love. And that's why the people that I love the most, that I expect the most from, and that I want the most from, that's why they have the ability to anger me so much. And like I said, if I see a child getting bullied, if I see someone getting abused, and I don't get angry, then I got to question my love for God and my love for that person. All right? That's why I'm going to say anger is not bad. It's just what we do with anger that could be bad. All right? The Bible mentions more than 375 times the anger or wrath of God, that God gets angry. So when we have this emotion of anger inside us, it's not against God. It's actually of God. And the fact that we're made in God's image and likeness is what gives us the ability to get angry when crimes happen or when things happen that shouldn't happen. And when you think of God's anger and God's wrath, usually people think that's an Old Testament thing. That's a New Testament thing just as much. Did Jesus get angry? When did Jesus get angry? All right, the famous time is when he was in the temple and he kicked the people out. You made my, my father's house a, a place of merchandise. It should be a house of prayer. But there's other times he got angry too. Remember when he was talking to the Pharisees? He got pretty angry at them when he said, woe to you and woe to you and woe to you. Woe to you is like saying, like, woe means like condemnation, meaning like you are going to go someplace hot, okay, is what he's saying to them, all right? They called him brood of vipers. And he said all kinds of things. He said whitewashed tombstones. Even the Holy Spirit gets angry. You know where it says in the Bible that, that do not grieve the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was grieved? Grieved is a form of anger, okay? It's the same root emotion. Anger, the emotion, is not a sin. It's how you respond to that emotion and what causes that emotion that's the sin. And that's what we're going to look at today. St. Paul says, be angry and do not sin in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, which he's quoting from the book of Psalms. So again, Old Testament, New Testament, says that there is a way to be angry and not be sinning. And that's what we need to discover. And like I said, the forms of sin, the emotion is not the sin. What caused the emotion? Is it selfish? Is it self-centered? Is it about me? Is it greedy anger? And two, how do I respond to that anger and what do I do based on it? If anger is caused by selfish, sin. If anger is out of control, sin. But there is a way, and that's what we want to see, is how to be angry and do not sin. A couple verses from the book of Proverbs right here. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. When King Solomon says this, whoever has no rule over his spirit means that whoever gets angry and just lashes out, gets angry and just acts, whoever has uncontrolled anger, it says is like a what? Is like a city without walls. Why? What does that mean? It means that he's defenseless. Like if I'm a city and I have no walls, people can just march in from, like you wake up in the morning and someone just built a tent right there and said, put a flag right there and said, this is my city. I'm defenseless. A city without walls. Well, you're the same way if you can't control your spirit. You know why? Because I'm going to see you over there and be like, hey, let's go push this button. And I just come and I just push the button and you, Wah! you have no control. You're defenseless. I controlled you. I'm in charge of your life. The person who says, so-and-so makes me so mad. You're in the weakest position in life if you allow someone else to make you mad. Next verse, Proverbs 16, verse 32 says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Solomon is saying, I would rather control my spirit than be a mighty warrior and a mighty king over a ruler over cities and nations, things like that. You know why? Because whenever you lose control of your anger, you lose control of your spirit, you always lose. Lose control of spirit equals lose. You lose friendships. You lose family sometimes. You may lose a job. You may lose your respect. You may lose your reputation. You may lose your peace. You may lose your health. You always lose when anger is outside of your control. So what we're going to do is we are going to study the issue of anger and what caused us to get angry and how we express that anger. And like you saw, the show The Simpsons gave us four characters, and we're going to look at the four characters, all right, and each of them somehow naturally express 
the four different ways that people express anger. Now, before I jump into the different ways we express anger, I say today we're going to talk about controlling your temper. Two groups of people in the room here right now. One group is saying on the guilty side, uh, don't talk to me about my anger. I know I got a problem. Everyone knows I got a problem. You're just going to come here and tell me, don't get angry. Man, I heard it a thousand times, and I tried it a thousand times, and I failed a thousand times. You're just going to make me feel guilty. There's nothing I can do. I tried for years, and I can't do anything about it. To those people, I say, no, that's not true. Don't talk like that. There's no such thing as you can't control it. There is anger is a, what you, again, anger is an emotion. But what you do after that is a learned behavior. You learned how to respond when you get angry. And just the same way you learned it, you can unlearn it. And you can learn new habits. And with the power of God, you can change. Don't let no one tell you that you can't change. That's against the gospel. The second group is the ones who are saying, I got no problem with anger. I'm okay with anger. Not, uh, take notes for what's his face. And I'll leave it on their desk in the morning. What you're going to see here today, especially when we go through the four types of anger, everyone has a problem with anger. The expression of anger differs amongst us. And there's some that appear worse than others. But it's all the same inside. Like what I'm trying to say is we all got a problem with anger. We just, some of us express it in a more elegant way, in a more classy kind of a way. But all of us struggle to control our anger at times. And you're going to see when we go through the four, which of these groups you might fall into. Said another way, just because you're not an explosion, you're not a volcanic eruption every time you get angry, doesn't mean you have a problem with anger. In fact, you might even have a bigger problem because you might have a hidden problem that everyone else around you feels the effects of, but you're the only one who doesn't. So everyone needs to pay attention. Let's go through the four types. The first type of anger is the machine gun. All right, and the machine gun, that's the easy one. We'll spend the least amount of time on this one because everyone knows the machine gun. This is the exploder. This is the guy who is a volcano. You push his button, and he erupts. Everybody in the office knows the machine gun. Everybody walking down the street, everybody in the restaurant, when that guy didn't get his soup warm, knows who the machine gun guy is. He's the guy who is very expressive, shall we say. He yells. Or it could be she, I, he or she. I'll use them interchangeably. They yell. They scream. They throw. They curse. All right. They wear it on their sleeve, so to speak. These guys, because all of us have anger and things that make us angry, these guys are ticking time bombs because it's just a matter of time before they explode. And everyone has different degrees of sensitivity. Some people, the first push, and they explode. Other people may take a couple more. They may be a little bit less sensitive. But at some point in time, they're going to explode because they're a machine gun. You all know them. Who's the first machine gun in the Bible? Cain is the first machine gun, okay? If you look in Genesis chapter 4, God accepted a sacrifice from Cain's brother Abel, and he liked Abel's sacrifice so much. Cain sacrificed something cheap and something not very good, so God wasn't so happy with that. Cain got upset at his brother, is what it says. It says, the Lord looked with favor on Abel, that's the brother, and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Anger? Okay. How did he respond to that anger? Now, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. Uh, hey, uh, why don't you uh, come out here to the field with me for a little bit? Let's uh, go spend some time together. And they were in the field. Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Machine gun, key word, attack. That's what machine guns do. You push them, they attack. You bite them, they bite back. You talk harsh to them, they talk harsher back. A machine gun's natural response, their defense mechanism is swing, swing, push, push, angry attack. Now, personally, I have the most compassion for the machine guns. I feel for these guys. I'm not a machine gun. Nobody has ever seen me get angry, or at least very rare. That doesn't mean I don't get angry. I'll tell you why I like the machine gun. Because they, first of all, I feel bad for them because when I say we're going to talk about anger, everyone thinks of the machine gun, and it's not fair to them. We all struggle with anger in different ways, and just because they're the most noticeable doesn't mean they're the ones who have the biggest problem. They have a problem, there's no doubt. 
It's just the most noticeable for them. The other reason I feel bad for them, because if you're a machine gun, the consequences are the greatest for you. Because for you, a moment of anger could result in a lifetime of regret. And you see that all the time. It's not, I'm not saying fair, unfair. That's just the nature. If this is how you express anger, then you really need to take a look at this. But I believe that God has hope for every one of us. All right, let's go from the opposite extreme of the machine gun. We'll go to the mute. The mute is the opposite of the machine gun. The machine gun explodes. The, the mute implodes. The machine gun gets violent. The mute gets silent. The machine gun blows up. The mute clams up. And they internalize everything. Let's make fun of the mutes right now. If you're a mute, you know you're a mute if, or your spouse is a mute if, you never, ever admit that you're angry. If you can be in the biggest fight, and you say, no, I'm not angry. I'm just disgusted. You know you're a mute if you have fights over who got angry first. And you will not let go of the fact that you didn't get angry first. And you have fights even whether or not you are angry. And y'all are fighting. And you're asking, asking whether or not you're angry. Because a mute, the number one rule of life is we lie through our teeth. We never admit that we are angry. We will lie to ourselves. We will lie to you. We will lie in a court of law. We will never admit that we have an anger inside of us. And whether or not you're wondering which one I can be kind of a mute kind of a person. Here's the problem with mutes. Mutes, you look down on the machine guns. And you judge them. And you say they lack self-control. And I say to you, mutes, that you lack just as much self-control. But yours is inside, theirs is outside. They're receiving the consequences of theirs from all kinds of people. You are not, and therefore, you have to be even more careful because yours is a hidden kind of out of control. They explode out loud. You explode within. But I got news for you. If one explodes this way and the other is like a slow simmering kind of implode this way, end result is destruction in the end. Example from the Bible is Jeremiah the prophet. All right, look what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 15, verse 17 through 18. He says, I sat alone. Key for a mute is I sat alone. I sat alone because of your hand, for you have filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? A mute doesn't explode. They sit. They internalize. They kind of get grumpy. They kind of, like, keep it all kind of inside them. And then they say this. Why is my wound incurable? Why I refuse to be healed? What's the answer, Mr. Mute? Why is it that you can't be healed? Because you're keeping it all inside. And as much as you keep it inside, then you will never find healing. I read a nice quote about anger. It says, every time you swallow anger, your stomach keeps score. Every time you swallow anger, your stomach keeps score. Physically, but I'm talking about relationally too. That when I swallow it, and I swallow it. Then I say, no, everything is fine. But everything isn't fine. And there's a distance that's growing between us and a bitterness and a resentment. And everything isn't fine. And my body is keeping score on what I just swallowed. Well, just the same way your body has to release the stuff that you stick in here. Okay? Your body needs to release that anger stuff too. And you mute you need to find a way to deal with your anger in a godly, healthy way as well. Number three, the martyr. The martyr are the people, the professional pity partyers. Professionals that throw in the pity party and the woe is me. And the martyr, oftentimes, this person makes me crazy. And I, because I'm not a martyr, I say, this person is crazy. The martyr doesn't say that. The martyr says, I must be bad. Or I must have done this. Or I must be a bad friend. Or I must be the worst person in the world. And I'll probably never have friends. And I'll probably never be able to win. And I'll probably... And they always blame themselves and put themselves down and punish themselves and feel like it's all their fault. Well, let me talk to you martyrs right now. 
Maybe it's not your fault. Maybe that person is crazy. They could pretend your boss could be crazy. Your coworker could be crazy. It may not be you. It might be you, but it might not be. If it's someone in your family, they could definitely be crazy. Everyone knows every family has one crazy relative. And if you don't know who the crazy relative is, every family has one crazy relative. A good example from the Bible of a martyr is the son, not the prodigal son, the brother of the prodigal son, the older brother. Remember, the father who had two sons, the, ba- the one went away, and he spent all the money, then he came back, and the father said, welcome back, throw a big party. The older brother, who was good the whole time, look what he says in Luke 15, 28. It says, but he, the older brother, was angry and would not go in to the feast. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. You're a martyr if people have to plead with you. Please forgive me. It's okay. If people, if you people have to plead with you and beg you, say, no, 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 I promise. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It's not pleading with you. Martyrs can be kind of party poopers, okay, as the older brother was here to this feast. Because when he got angry, he didn't express it, but he felt bad about himself. Machine guns, mute, martyrs. And then the fourth is, skip those again, that's okay, is the manipulators. Right, you can write down, I think it'll catch up. Sometimes it just kind of, there we go. The manipulators. And we all got a little manipulator inside of us. The manipulator's mantra in life is you don't get mad, you get even. A manipulator also will never tell you that they're mad. No, I'm not angry. But you see that look in their eyes. And you know, you will feel their wrath at some point in time. They are plotting. They are scheming, and at some point in time, manipulators, what they do, they jab. They jab. Oh, no, I'm not angry. I'm just joking around. I can't take a joke. What's wrong? And then they jab, and they jab, and they jab, and they're just building that resentment, and they're going to make you pay until you come out and you beg for their forgiveness. <laughs> Think about the manipulators is they're smart, and they rarely get caught. There's a line. Okay, the machine gun gets angry, and they just go. The, the mute and the martyr, they kind of stay back over here. They're never even close to the line. The manipulator goes to the line, kind of cross, and oh, look, I was just joking. We're just discussing. And they take it, oh, well, it's a big deal. And they know where that line is, and they know how to push, and they get back, and they want to push you, especially if you're a machine gun, and you with the manipulator, that's a bad combination for you if you're in the machine gun because they know how to push your buttons. And they know how to get you to explode, and then it's your fault. I'll be honest. Who is good at being manipulators? Religious people. Religious people. Because a religious person, I'm a spiritual person. I'm not going to get angry because I'm a holy man. But I will tell you that I was grieved in the spirit by your actions. And therefore, you must receive the chastening of the Lord right now. And we justify it. And we say nice things like, you know, we pray for them and bless their heart and bless, you know, bless their heart, right? Oh, bless that person's heart. I just had to tell the boss that that person was struggling with this, so I told the boss, bless their heart. Bless their heart? What you're really saying is bless their face. In your face is what you're saying to them. Who is an example? These are the Pharisees, the religious guys from back in the day. They didn't like Jesus very much. They didn't get angry at him, but they were the manipulators. Jesus said to the man, he healed this man, to stretch out your hand. And he, the man did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they, the Pharisees, were filled with rage. Why were they filled with rage when he did a miracle? Because they hated his popularity. He was becoming more popular than them. They hated that. They were filled with rage. And they discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Plotting, scheming, manipulating their way to getting even. All four of these behaviors, like I said, they are not inherent inside you. You were not born in a martyr way or in a mute way. It's a learned behavior. Most likely, if you're a machine gun, you saw a lot of machine gun activity when you were growing up. And you learned that's how you respond to anger. If you're a mute, 
you saw, like let's say you're a young lady, and that's the way your mom always dealt with it, and that's the way your mom always dealt with it. And then you grow up, you're probably going to deal with it in that same way because that's how you were trained. It's a learned behavior, and the same way we learn, we can unlearn. What we're going to talk about, regardless of which of these four you are, what we're going to talk about now is now how we can enter into this warfare with the button pushers. And our job is not to strike back, but to disarm. How we can disarm those people who push our buttons and make us like crazy people. Four principles that we'll take from the book of Proverbs about how to disarm the button pusher. Number one, most important one, most important one. Well, they're not most important. They're all most important. Think before react. Think before react. Pause, time out, think before react. Don't hit send. Don't respond to the text message. Walk away. Thomas Jefferson said, said something nice one time. He said, if you're angry, count to 10. If you're very angry, count to 100. Pause before you respond and do something that you are going to regret. A couple of verses from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 29, verse 22. An angry man stirs up strife, and a furious man abounds in transgression. Next verse, 14, 17. A quick-tempered person does foolish things. How many foolish things, whether at work or in my relationship with my family or with my friends, how many foolish things could I have avoided if I had just taken the time out, walked away for 10 minutes, and then come back? How many fewer emails would I have sent? How many fewer text messages would I have responded to? How many fewer jokes and sarcastic remarks would I have shot back with if I had just walked away thought about it, thought about the consequences of what I'm about to do because we agreed anytime there's uncontrolled anger, there's going to be loss involved. It's just a matter of what degree it is. How many things could I have saved and avoided? You may be, whatever position that you're in, let's say you're a parent, let's say you're a, a, a supervisor at work, okay, you're in some position of authority. And you are thinking of using anger to motivate someone to get something done. A coach of a team. You are th thinking about using anger to get someone to do something, to motivate them, to manipulate them, to push them. From the bottom of my heart, don't do it. Don't do it. Anger never works. It works short term. And it might get you the short term result. But long term, it will never work. And how many relationships do I see that are broken today because someone was pushing the anger and pushing the anger and eventually? How many family relationships? How many, like, friendship relationships? How many marriages was broken because someone thought it was okay to use anger to get the other person to do what they wanted? It isn't okay. Anger always alienates people. Anger always alienates people. It pushes kids away. It pushes spouses away. It pushes coworkers away. It pushes people that work under you away. Anger always pushes and creates alienation and distance. Short term maybe, long term, nothing will destroy a relationship faster than anger that is uncontrolled. So before you respond, before you fire back, you step back. Proverbs 14 verse 29. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Here's what I propose for you to do. When something, take a step back. What do I do when I take a step back? Ask yourself a few questions. I came up with three questions. Ask yourself, number one, why am I angry? I'm angry. Why am I angry? Is it about me or is it about what's right? Sometimes you're angry about what's right. Be angry about what's right. But is it about me? Is it my pride? Is it my ego? Is it because I wanted this? Is it because that person took what I wanted? Why am I angry? I know you're angry, and I'm not saying it's wrong to be angry, but I'm asking you why. Take a step back. Why? Number two, ask yourself this question. What do I want to accomplish in this situation? What do I want to accomplish? What's the end result? And I know the people who are very emotional. You're struggling with this one because I'm being very logical. Okay? Logical people. There's some benefits to being logical, okay? There's some benefits, and this is one of them. There's some benefits to being the emotional, so I'm not saying better or worse. 
But what I'm saying is, on this one, go with the logical. Ask yourself, what am I trying to accomplish? I'm upset because he did this. What do you want the end result to be? Restoration or hurt? And then number three, based on what you answered number two, what do I want to get done? What's the best strategy to get me there? I guarantee you, if you ask yourself those three questions, why am I angry, what do I want, and how do I get there? Never the answer will be explode. Like the answer number three will be to accomplish my desired intimacy in my marriage, I will explode on my wife. To accomplish what I want for my professional career, I will explode at the office. Never that will be the result. But only if we take a step back and we ask ourselves, why am I angry? What do I want? How do I get what I want? The other thing that you'll do when you step back is you'll do number two. Number two I touched on last week, and I'll mention it again this week, and I'll probably mention it every week for this series. Look past their words to their pain. We look past words to pain. Before we seek to be understood, we seek to understand. All right, that was a famous prayer by St. Francis of Assisi. Before we seek to be understood, before I respond back saying, how come you don't understand me? I take a step back and I try to understand where you're coming from. Look, let's be honest. I told you all this last week. There's no bad people in this world. There's no bad people. We vilify people and we say this person is bad and this person is mean. This person is judgmental. There's no, there's no bad people. That person isn't judgmental because they came out the wound judging the doctor and stuff like that. That person's judgmental because they're insecure. They don't want to be judgmental. They hate their judgmentalness. They hate it more than you hate it. They can't. It's the expression that I told you all before, hurt people, hurt people. That person is angry and is hurtful because they themselves have been hurt one too many times. That person is resentful and bitter and cranky. Not that they don't want to be. I mean, no one wakes up and says, I want to be cranky today. No, you all saw the, it was in um, the Scrooge, okay, in the Christmas Carol. Once the guy had love, he became a much nicer guy. Like once the guy, but he didn't want, no one wants to be a Scrooge. I saw, I read this nice, like, kind of comparing it. A baby, when a baby's crying, okay, baby's screaming their heads off, right? You can't go to the baby and say, you shouldn't be crying. I gave you food. I gave you this. You can't, you can't. Like, the baby's crying. You know what happens if I pick up the baby and I hug it and it feels my warmth? Maybe I sing a nice little lullaby. Baby becomes much better. I just needed to understand their pain. And we as human beings are all big babies. The meanest people are the people who have been dealt with the most meanly. I promise you. I promise you. The people who are the most loving are not by nature the most loving. They're the people who have been loved the most, oftentimes. The people who are generous are the people who people was generous with them. And that's why you see people who are acting in this way. We're not going to deal with them at this level. We're going to go beyond it to try to understand their hurt. Solomon says this in Proverbs 19.11. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. If you are wise, it will be to your glory. If you can look past that person's words and look to that person's heart and see the pain in their heart and see their hurt and talk to them at that level. Don't talk about this. Go around this and deal with this. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that how Jesus dealt with people? Samaritan woman saw that lady, and he didn't say, lady, you're acting like this, and you have this husband, and you, and you, and you, and you. He looked past that. He said, here's an empty lady. Lady's empty. She's thirsty. This lady was thirsty. Lady, let me talk to you about some water. Then when he talked about water, she's convinced, say, okay, now don't do this again. Don't, don't say this. Don't do this. But first he dealt with her pain, and then he healed like the wound or the words and the actions. The more you understand, the more you'll be able to understand, I'm sorry, to deal with your own anger, okay, and overlook the transgressions of others. There's a poem by a guy named Edwin Markham who said the following. He said, they drew a circle to shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took them in. I'll say that one again. It's kind of basically what he's saying. I, didn't, I had to read it like three or four times to understand it, but it's nice. What he's saying is 
that these people were doing this to me, and this is how I respond to them, to what they did to me. They drew a circle to shut me out. Heretic, a rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took them in. People deal with you this way. How do you respond? Are you going to go eye for eye? Tooth for tooth? Or you want to be above that? Jesus was above that. And Jesus calls us to be above that. And our life, look, I take this one very, very, very personally for me. There is nothing that I will allow you or anyone out there to do that I would call you my enemy. You understand what I'm saying? Like there's nothing you can do to me to make me say that person's my enemy. You know why? Because in the end, regardless of you, I'm going to stand before him. And I don't want you to have any effect on my relationship with him. And I'm not going to give you any power over me that I'll stand up there and I'll say, but they did and they did and they did. He'll say, but I told you, I don't want that. So I don't care what you do. I may avoid you. I may, uh, may, may not invite you over for dinner. But I will not allow anyone to have that ability over me to say, yes, I'm this person's enemy. When you respond tit for tat, you do as, you're no better than them. You want to be like better than them? You respond like Jesus did at a higher level. <clears throat> that ain't easy. That ain't, now, we're, now we're talking about some serious stuff right now. That ain't easy. What I just said there is nice words, but that stuff ain't easy. And that stuff isn't natural. And it isn't going to be easy that someone attacks me and I'm going to love them and not respond back at that level. That's why next thing we need to do, number three, is we need to ask God for help. Like, let's be honest. If we're going to live this Christ-like life, and we are not going to go tit for tat, and we're not going to go eye for eye, and we're going to love our enemies, that we need to ask for some help. And we need to ask for some serious help. There's a nice verse. Psalm 141, verse 3. It says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Look, if you struggle with anger, this may be a good verse to memorize, a good verse to pray. Set, oh, say it with me, say it with me, so we all pray it like together. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Say it again like you mean it. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. That's a nice thing. If you struggle with this, you've got to ask God's help. Because you're not going to be able to do it on your own. You've tried on your own, and you can't. You know why you can't do it on your own? Imagine that I have up here toothpaste, okay, like a stick of toothpaste, and I squeeze it. What's going to come out? Toothpaste. Why? Because it's what's on the inside. The answer is whatever's on the inside comes out when I squeeze it. Now, if I squeeze a lemon, what comes out? Whatever's on the inside of a lemon. If I squeeze... Yeah, um, you know, the, the, the Pillsbury Doughboy, whatever's on the inside of the Pillsbury Doughboy, comes out. What you are inside comes out when you're squeezed. What you are inside comes out when you're squeezed. You want to know why you need God's help? Because your problem, forgive me, your problem with anger isn't your coworker. And it isn't your wife. And it isn't your spouse. And it isn't the traffic on the 66. And it isn't the weather. And it isn't the coffee. And it is none of those things. You know, what your, you know what your problem is? It is. We blame those things. Traffic made me mad. My circumstance made me mad. She made me mad. We blame those things. But it's not those things. You know why? Because a lot of other people in the same traffic. A lot of other people who uh, had the same circumstances. A lot of the people whose wives are ten times more annoying than yours. There's a lot of people out there with much worse circumstances than you. It ain't the circumstance. You know what it is? You. And because the problem is inside you, if I have a well, and the well is bringing out bad water, and then I just change the bucket, that I solve the problem? I change the, the pump that pulls the wa water out. Did I change the problem? No, the problem is the water inside. 
the only way that we're going to solve our anger long term is we need Jesus to feel, heal us from the inside. There's a myth out there that we have that you can like read about in psychology books and Dr. Phil and all that kind of stuff, which says that a human being has anger like this person does something to me. So I have this much anger. So I should express this anger and then I'll be fine. And there's like, you know, a set amount of anger that we all have. And once we express it, everything will be fine. That's the problem with that theory. The truth is, is that you don't have a set amount of anger. You don't have a bucket of anger inside you. You have a factory of anger inside you. And in fact, the more you express anger, the more anger, like it generates more. It's constantly. So the more anger you get, the more anger is going on. So the solution isn't to find better ways to express it. Yes, that's a good thing to do. But the solution is to ask God to come inside and not let me get angry over so many things. That's the solution. And Jesus was squeezed. Squeezed shows what's on the inside. Jesus on the cross, they squeezed him, they squeezed him, they squeezed him. What came out? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What came out? Love. Forgiveness. I'm worried if it was me and you, and I'm a good guy, and I'm a nice guy, but you squeeze me like that. Father might come out, but the rest of the words might not be the same. Your coworker, your spouse, your boss, your whatever, those things are not the problem. They just reveal the problem. They just squeeze us and show what's on the inside. We must ask God for help because we want to get to the point that when we're squeezed, what comes out is love. When we're squeezed, what comes out is grace. When we're squeezed, what comes out is mercy and all those beautiful things that Jesus had. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. When the Spirit is inside of us and the Spirit is working and we're asking the presence of God in our life and the people squeeze us, what comes out? Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you know people like this? Like, can you think of examples? I can think of examples. People that get squeezed in life, and you go visit them in the hospital. Thank God. And not just like, yeah, thank God. No, like, really, like, you know what, I thank God. Because he's given me so many good things. Like, people that they get squeezed, and you're like, like, thank you. They're thankful. And they say, you know what, God taught me this. God taught you that. You're crazy. Like, you're ready to curse God. Like, we should curse God. Let's curse God together. Let's throw stuff at God. Let's throw stuff at the ceiling. And there's people who when they're squeezed and they're squeezed and they're cursed and they're ridiculed, what comes out, that's, you ain't going to learn that watching Oprah. You ain't going to read a book by Dr. Phil and learn that. You want that? You stand before God and you say, God, come inside me. Cleanse me from the inside. I let go of my way of dealing with it. I want to deal with it your way. You stand and you pray. And you pray. And you say, God, change this anger factory and get rid of it. Put in a love factory. What do you think will happen when you do that? What do you think will happen when you do that? You stand today. And you pray that prayer to God. What do you think will happen? I encourage you to find out. That's all I'll say. You ain't the first person who prayed for God to change their heart. And you certainly won't be the last. I encourage you to find out what happens when you stand before God in full sincerity of heart and you say, God, forgive me, cleanse me, change me. Number four. Long term only real solution to anger. I must base my identity in Christ Jesus himself. I must base my identity in Christ Jesus himself. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I must know who I am. And I must know whose I am. I am his and he is mine. And his kingdom is my kingdom. His throne is my throne. That I am loved eternally and I have everlasting significance and value, not because of anything I've done, but because of who it is that is in my life. Once he put this ring on me that says, child of me, 
that I became eternally significant and eternally important and unconditionally loved and unconditionally everything that you can add on the on, on adjective that you can put up there, all that belongs to me. And that's who I am. Why I'm saying that is important for dealing with anger. Because the reason why we so often get angry is because we build our identity on other things. And those other things, when they fall, we get angry. I build my identity on my career. Well, what happens when my career falls? What happens when I get laid off? What happens when, when that guy takes my job? What happened to my identity? Anger. Well, I build my identity on my relationships, on my family. I raise these kids and my kids and my kids. What happens when my kids get sick? What happens if God forbid something happens to my kids? What happens if my kids move away to the other side of the world? Then where's my identity? I build my identity on being the popular one. You ain't always going to be popular. I'm the funny one. I'm the rich one. I'm the smart one. I'm the one who dresses. Look at the way I dress. Um, and you build your identity on any of these things, and it all falls apart. The only way that you can be eternally secure in who you are is you base your identity, you stand on the one who will never change. And that identity is in Christ himself. Look at this verse from Proverbs 29, verse 25. It says, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Fear of man is a snare. Fear of man is carrying, my identity is here, is somewhere here. It's always a snare. You all know what snare means? It means a trap. It means like, like an ambush. It's a snare. Watch out. You put your stuff in man, and it all falls apart, and you sink. But the one who puts his trust in God is kept safe. Look. A lot of us, and now I listen very carefully. Now I'm talking to the church people, the non-church people, the religious people, the non-religious people, whatever category you put yourself in. I don't care if this is your first time here in church, your 500th time here in church. A lot of us need to take a step back in life. We need to take a step back, and we need to go inside to the root, and we need to see what's going on inside me. Yeah, I'm going through the motions. And yeah, I go to church. And yeah, I do nice things. And yeah, I don't steal anybody and I don't murder anybody and I don't adultery anybody. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing the right things. But I need to go inside and see where is my identity really? Where is all my hope? Where is all my trust? Is it in that I'm a child of God or is it in something outside? You look inside, I guarantee you you're going to find stuff that you didn't like in there. Stuff that you didn't know was in there and stuff that, but the good news is, sometimes you look inside there and you say there's anxiety, there's fear, there's, there's insecurity, there's pride, there's all that kind of stuff. And the only way this is going to work is to throw this out and start all over. But the good news is, I know someone who's a very, very good heart doctor. Very good heart doctor. He hadn't lost a patient yet. Every patient that goes to him, he's like, no copay yet. And I think that if you want to make the crazy maker stop in life, bottom line is you never stop crazy making. You won't. You can't change other people, but what you can change is yourself. And my encouragement for you and my hope for you, my hope for all of us, is that we go inside there and we say, God, Change this. God, there's fear in there. Change that fear to faith. God, there's like anxiety in there. Change that anxiety to trust. God, there's all kinds of earthly stuff, all kinds of insecurity, all kinds of change that, God, and just show me who I am in you. Show me who, let me live my life just with my eyes on you. And when I have my eyes focused fully on you, this is the verse that we want to get to in life. We want to get to Romans 12, 20, and then we will not overcome evil by evil. We will overcome evil with good. Evil won't be able to overcome us, and the crazy makers won't have any power over us. We will have power over them through good. This is how Jesus lived his life. No one had power over Jesus. Jesus overcame evil and anger and hatred and all that stuff 
is good. And now he calls us to do the same. We will fight and a lot will take a step back when anger comes. We will make sure that we look and we try to understand the other person. We'll ask God for help. But we will most importantly, we will base our identity in him and we will derive our security from there. And once that's there, no one has the ability to harm that in any way. I'll be praying for you guys this week, and especially for the people who, like I said, somehow I feel like there's some of us here today that, that need to take a step back in our spiritual lives. And we need to stop just going through the motion. We need to see really where we're at. And it's easy that we come and we hear all the things, we sing the songs, we write the notes, and we say all these nice things. We want to make sure that we're not just saying that, that we're really living it. And my prayer for you this week is that God would reveal to you the areas in your life that he wants to get rid of and put himself inside there and that your identity is based on that. All right, guys, let's stand for our prayers. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you that no matter where we are, we can always turn to you. And you always are there ready to pour down your power upon us. We pray, Lord, that you would come and do like a heart transplant inside us. And you, Lord, know right now each and every single heart where we're at and where we need to be at, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would really come inside and do a work that only you can do. And change us, Lord, so that we base ourselves entirely on you. We don't want to look around and derive our security from anything in this world because we know, Lord, that that stuff isn't going to last. We trust in you. We believe in you. And we know, Lord, that you will do a mighty work inside our hearts this week. Help us all, Lord, and all those who are struggling with the crazy makers in their lives to, to, to find peace and to find rest and to be able to, to live this verse of not overcoming evil with evil but overcoming evil with good. We pray this, Lord, in the name of your Son, with the intercessions and the prayers of all your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just a reminder that we have life groups going on these days, and the life groups going on these days are about this Crazy Maker series. So if you'd still like to participate, today's your last chance to sign up. Make sure you just stop by the connection table and do so. If not, have a great week, and I'll see you all next week.